Thank you. Um, so uh, this is something that we touched on a little bit yesterday, and it's something I've been uh, working on for about the last uh, 10 plus years. Um, I want to start off by saying that from an economic analysis perspective, the importance uh, of perspective and, and one of the difficulties that we have with economic analyses is that um, most of them in the academic world are performed from the societal perspective. So that's where you have the qualities and, and all this other sort of stuff. But if you're trying to make decisions at a, a, a different unit than society, um, that type of perspective doesn't really translate very well. And in fact, um, it, particularly in the United States, since we don't have a national health system, a societal perspective is particularly problematic. And so one of the things that um, uh, I've done in, uh, in collaboration with my colleagues is adapted the tools of economic analysis uh, for different settings. This uh, irritates the bejesus out of the academic economists, but uh, it does work. And so I'm going to give you four examples of this. We're going to go through these very quickly. Um, and so uh, a lot of this uh, falls into, and then a miracle occurs between these two things. So I'm going to set it up. I'm going to give you the answer. And there's a miracle in between there. But I do provide references for everything. So for those of you that are interested in checking our work, uh, we do, in fact, explain our miracles. Dan made an interesting comment yesterday about the afternoon uh, that it would take to slap together uh, an, an economic decision analysis. Um, this is one branch of a tree that my uh, analyst uh, came up with for the universal Lynch syndrome screening. The entire thing actually covered his door of his office at eight point font. Uh, so these things can get incredibly uh, complex. But fortunately, uh, through a process of pruning and, and other things, you can actually get down to the point of getting useful information out. And so we as a system, when I was at Intermountain Healthcare, decided based on the EGAP working group recommendation that we were going to implement universal screening, uh, tumor screening for Lynch syndrome. But there are several different ways that you can do that. Um, uh, you can use immunohistochemistry with BRAF and uh, methylation from LH1, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so and the EGAP recommendation was silent in terms of the best way to do it. And so what we did is we used our economic model to say, well, we know the costs of all these things. We know exactly what it costs us uh, for this. And so we just used those as our input variable. So we didn't have to mess around with sensitivity analyses or assumptions. We knew the number. Um, and what we found was that using these different approaches essentially had no impact at all on the number of Lynch syndrome cases that we were going to identify. But if you look at the cost of the different approaches, there's a significant difference in terms of the cost per case of Lynch syndrome detected from 10,700 with this approach to over 13,000. So from a system perspective that's going to have to spend money on this, this is a really important piece of information because they can spend $3,000 less per case detected, uh, which in the long run is uh, w with no loss of sensitivity. So that was really important in terms of decision making. And I didn't show the data, but uh, as we were implementing this, uh, we had seven different hospitals that were doing colorectal cancer resection. And one of the hospitals came and said, well, we really should only be using this for under age 50. That's really the best place to do it. And so we said, well, usually we have then at that point an, an eminence-based uh, medicine discussion, which is, well, I think this and you think that. But we went back to our model and we modeled out the different ages. And what we said was, you know, it's cheaper if you use an under 50 cutoff, but you miss half the cases. And the system, when they looked at the total expenditure, said, you know, if we poked around in the C-suite couch cushions, we could probably come up with the money to cover this. We're screening everybody. And so the data was extremely useful to move this forward in a consistent way across the system. The second example is um, IL-28B and protease inhibitors in hepatitis C. Uh, and protease inhibitors at that time were routinely used in uh, HCV viral genotype 1. And there were s several economic analyses that supported the cost effectiveness. But because viral genotypes 2 and 3 are more responsive to therapy, um, th the standard therapy did not include protease inhibitors. However, we also knew that there was a patient genotype in IL-28B that predicted good responders versus poor responders in response to treatment in all HCV viral genotypes. But there was almost no evidence um, uh, 
related to the impact of this in uh, genotypes two and three. And so the question we asked was, if you did IL-28B genotyping and you used that to select candidates where you use triple therapy from the get-go, the poor responders, you initially uh, used a protease inhibitor just as you would for genotype one, how much improvement in sustained viral response, which is the intermediate endpoint uh, of interest, is needed to cross a threshold of cost effectiveness? And we did this analysis, and what we found was that if you administered tr triple therapy to patients that had the resistant IL-28B genotype, you only needed an improvement in sustained viral response of about 2 percent to cross a cost-effectiveness threshold, which was stunning. Whereas if you treated all patients with triple therapy, then you'd need to uh, see a uh, improvement of 11 percent. So this was groundbreaking work, which was immediately supplanted by the new medication. So, so this is all completely irrelevant, but it still was fun to do. Um, science marches on. The third um, uh, study that I wanted to briefly present shows the importance of using a patient perspective. So this was uh, a, a prospective uh, trial. There was a small prospective um, pharmacogenomic um, informed trial of warfarin at Intermountain Healthcare. And so we worked with David Veenstra and his group at the University of uh, Washington to develop a policy model using these data to assess the cost effectiveness. And what we found out when we did this was that if you tested versus, uh, preemptively versus not doing testing, the arms were essentially equivalent. We couldn't really detect uh, much of a difference between the two arms. However, the prospective trial data showed that the tested patients, those that underwent pharmacogenomic testing, required two to three fewer INRs to get to stable dose. And so, all things being equal, I think a patient-centered perspective would say, you know, if you can disrupt that patient's life two to three times fewer by having them come in for INRs, that's a pretty important outcome from that patient because you're not taking them out of work or you're not taking them out of home, having them come down to the clinic, find parking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this basically says the costs are the same, so why not choose something that would be less disruptive from the patient? So that's a, a, a different perspective. We haven't done much uh, of this from the patient perspective, but I think we should do, um, be doing more uh, thinking about that. And then the last thing I want to present was uh, something that we've been working on recently uh, on generic modeling. Now, the problem um, with economic modeling is that it is complex. It requires um, specific expertise. Uh, that expertise is not necessarily broadly available. I was really fortunate at Intermountain that I had uh, an analyst who was very interested, and we kind of learned how to do it, and we found it was useful, but most places don't have that type of expertise. Um, and the other problem is that most models are created for a specific perspective, so they're one-off. So I can build my model for Intermountain Healthcare, uh, but then somebody else would have to build a model for Geisinger or um, UAB or whatever. Um, and, and all of the inputs then are customized, which means you can't really reuse the model. And so the question that we asked was, could you take a generic approach, build a generic model that would allow stakeholders to enter their relevant key parameters and generate results that would be relevant to decision making? So we knew it wouldn't be as good as a customized model, but it, could it be good enough? Could we expand this? Um, and then we wanted to uh, see how does this model perform against a gold standard approach to modeling. And so we used the test case of HLA-B1502, which we've heard a fair amount uh, about in association with carbamazepine to reduce the risk of severe cutaneous adverse events. Uh, and the rationale was this is a medically significant issue. Um, it's already been implemented in some settings. There are significant differences in allele frequencies of 1502 in different populations as well as cost and practice patterns uh, that lead to variations in cost effectiveness. So we knew that we would see uh, a, a variable inputs. Plus there was an existing gold standard economic model that had come out of Thailand. And so we did this under the, um, a supplement uh, that was through the University of Florida, um, uh, Economic Modeling Project for Pharmacogenomics for Prevention of Stevens-Johnson Syndrome. So I want to thank um, uh, sponsors and uh, our collaborators at the University of Florida and our global collaborators uh, for doing this. So um, 
This is an example of the decision tree here where uh, you would have three options. You would have no HLA-B screening, in which case you would have uh, HLA-B1502 carriers that might develop Stevens-Johnson syndrome or not, uh, and the non-carriers. And the, um, we made the assumption, which is okay for modeling, that there would be no Stevens-Johnson syndrome or TENS in the non-carrier population. That's not completely true, but the rate is low enough that you can essentially treat that as zero. We then had a universal uh, genetic screening arm where, again, with those tested positive, we're used, uh, we had them use an alternative drug, which in this case was valproate, because we heard yesterday about the phenytoin uh, issues, and assumed that no one would have a severe cutaneous event as, in that, which is a pretty reasonable assumption. We also, it's not shown here, but we also uh, built in the fact that VPA is not as effective a medication for, uh, for seizure control as um, a carbamazepine in these particular types of seizures. So that was built into the model. And then in those that tested negative, um, the true is there's a, the possibility of false negatives on the testing that would be relatively low. We know those numbers. Uh, and that those individuals might be at risk for TENS. And then we also modeled against the third alternative, which was being seen uh, just uh, emerging in Taiwan, I believe, where everybody was just moving away from carbamazepine. They were saying, I'm not going to test, I'm just going to use valproate. Uh, and we modeled that. And I'm just going to show you a few of the, um, this is uh, the approach. So here we said, here are all the variables that we need. And when we looked at the inputs, there were three types of inputs. One input variable was the one that uh, the users had to specify. So for example, uh, what is the prevalence of this allele? Well, that varies from population to population. So that would have to be entered for the specific population that was used in the generic model. We also needed to make it clear that the prevalence is different from the allele frequency and that you needed to multiply the allele frequency by two to get this input value. So we tried to make it as uh, user-friendly as possible. There are also the costs of care that vary from place to place. And so these are the uh, pieces, the components of the cost of care that would need to be included, cost of disease treatment, et cetera. We also had default values, values um, for things like the laboratory test performance and that where we had pretty good uh, information that these are going to be consistent. And so these could be pre-populated in the model. And then we had a third group of inputs where uh, we had default values that were based on reasonable evidence, but if the group had a specific input, they could actually insert their input into that value uh, set rather than using the default. And then we ran this against uh, three models, the Thai model that I had, uh, had mentioned, and then there were two uh, groups from Malaysia and Singapore uh, that actually uh, also um, participated in this project, and they developed their own country-specific model, which we then compared against this. And I'm not going to go through all the numbers here because it gets uh, uh, reasonably complex. But the bottom line was is that we found uh, that this actually performed reasonably well. It's feasible, uh, and it's an efficient and timely value-based method. So we get you in the ballpark of, you know, is this something that looks cost-effective or doesn't look cost-effective using this a generic approach? And so we think that if we uh, were able to do more of this generic modeling, that it would allow more people to sort of rapidly uh, perform this type of um, uh, modeling exercise without the extensive training uh, that is needed to create these models uh, de novo, and that hopefully that would help us to facilitate how implementation in different settings uh, would really look. And so the manuscript um, that is describing this uh, has just been uh, circulated to our internal group and will be uh, revised uh, and uh, submitted shortly. So that's the one um, manuscript that I don't have uh, in my reference section since that's still uh, a work in progress. So in conclusion, uh, defining perspectives is critically important. Uh, economic analysis tools can be used uh, pragmatically uh, to rationalize decision making. I will tell you it's tough to get these things published because the reviewers tend to be of the academic economist uh, variety and uh, they have problems with the way we use their tools. Um, but I, th I think uh, in the long run, uh, we've demonstrated that there's enough value from the perspective of the decision maker that irrespective of the um, academic uh, criticism, um, they are still uh, highly useful uh, for decision making.
Um, these are uh, references for the things that I had uh, specifically mentioned. And I, um, for those of you who are really interested, shameless plug here. Um, uh, this is a book that came out two years ago, Economic Evaluation in Genomic Medicine, that I wrote with some colleagues in, um, in Greece and the Netherlands. Um, the, the, the thing that's a little bit unusual about this book is that we have a, an introductory chapter on economics for geneticists, and then we have a chapter, Genetics for Economists, uh, which was, they, they were very fun to write, but we use a lot of pragmatic examples all the way through to illustrate the different perspectives. So I, I find it very useful, but I do get a, uh, you know, a, uh, a royalty for every copy sold. So uh, that, uh, that and uh, another uh, 50 cents will get me a coffee at Starbucks um, in the morning. So with that, I'll end. Great. We have time for some questions. Yes, Sandy. Mark, I just am curious, you know, from a computer science point of view, what, you know, the uh, first thought would be to take the generic model and, you know, add parameters to enable it to be as specific as the, you know, the country-specific models. But I'm guessing that in, in reality it's more complex than that. I'm just wondering where that complexity lies and why that's, why that's not possible. Right. So the complexity lies um, partly in the model construction itself. So the, the generic model trims down some of the decision points that if you really wanted to get a fine-tuned model, you would add additional complexity. Um, so for example, if I think my recollection is correct, that in the generic model, when, when we looked at the country-specific models, we realized that uh, the difference in efficacy of uh, Valpro-8 doesn't contribute a lot to the uh, end result. And so I think we um, suppress that in the generic model, whereas it does give you a little bit more accuracy if you were to include that. So what we tried to do is to say, what are the things that would require a tremendous amount of effort to populate a model, but at the end doesn't give you much of a bang for your buck, uh, meaning that you're using resources that are, are probably either not available or um, are, could be used better in other ways. And so that's how we tried to streamline this to some degree. And I think that uh, what you'd ultimately have to do in any of these situations is that you're not going to be able to create a generic model that's going to work, you know, globally. You're going to have to have some sort of a, a best practice model that is well understood and ideally probably tested in a couple of different settings to make sure that it's robust that you would then use to develop a generic model that could be uh, put out. Jeff. Thanks, Mark. Um, so since the notion of doing some of these economic modeling studies is relatively new, um, to us at least, uh, do you have um, a set of standard measures uh, that we should be thinking about capturing in order to allow us to do those, to develop those models you know, going forward? Is there, are there things that we can incorporate into our ongoing studies? Yeah, so the, um, uh, the world of economic modeling does have uh, published best practices in terms of uh, how this sh uh, should be done. And so uh, what we've attempted to do in all of those is to go to those uh, reference works uh, of best practices and make sure that we're following those. And so I, we don't need to um, adapt those, I think, for genetics or genomics in particular. I think they work well. Um, uh, and then it's a matter of um, uh, clearly identifying what are the things that we want to study and then being able to have um, uh, the uh, outcomes that are important and find the data sources. And so that's the biggest issue. And for the Lynch syndrome one, we frankly would not have been able to do that without, with the current uh, published data that was out there. But we were able to work with uh, Ohio State University and Heather Hample, uh, who had done a, a very large scale um, uh, study where they'd sequenced everybody. So we knew sort of the right answer uh, related to the um, uh, sensitivity and specificity of a tumor-based approach. None of, none of that was in the literature. But using that sort of gray data, uh, we were able to actually uh, make the model work. So the data sources are the biggest, uh, are the biggest issues. Right. And that's, so I'm, I'm wondering, can you provide or colleagues provide, you know, the the types of data and where we can find them to incorporate into our studies? It depends. <laughs> because it, it, all the data are, would be specific. Uh, 
to a given modeling exercise. So um, what, you, what, what you really do at the beginning of that is to say, here's the question, here are the inputs, and then you have to map that to data sources. And so um, you know, some of it is here are literature sources that can be used. And in some cases, and with the IL-28B uh, study, there clearly were, were no data for certain of the nodes. And so what, the way you deal with situations where there's no data is you generally get um, you know, an expert consensus of what do you think the right number is, but then you use a technique called sensitivity analysis that allows you to vary that. Say, what if I'm off by you know, two or five or 10 in either direction? How does that impact the result of the model? And what you find is, is that some of those inputs for which there's no data, it makes no difference that the re end result is the same irrespective of what value you choose in there. And that was the point I was trying to make yesterday, is that the real value of modeling is that when you have no data for certain decision points, you can use the model to determine, do we need to invest in getting that data, or is this something that really isn't important, in which case we should ignore it and put our resources elsewhere? Okay, yes, Mary? Mark, for your warfarin example, you mentioned that in the genotype guided group, they got by with two to few, two to three fewer INRs than in the non-gene. So how did that not translate into a effect on cost? Because the way that the cost is modeled doesn't include all of the uh, travel, time away from work, and that sort of thing. It just includes the INR cost, and so if you added up the cost of the three, and I, three INRs, it essentially was equivalent to the cost of the, of the genotyping. I see. And so that's so that's why. So if so, you could lit legitimately criticize uh, and say that uh, if you included those attendant costs, that that would have actually showed which, a difference. Which are huge, right? Um, not huge enough. So if you really? actually if three you actually, days where somebody has to leave work, find a babysitter, get a cab, get your yeah. daughter to take you to the doctor. In the cold hard reality of a lifetime perspective, you, it it's several de decimal points down the road. But the point that you're making is the critical one, is that from an economic modeling perspective, that makes no difference. From an individual's perspective, it makes a huge difference. And, and the economic modeling is not adequate. No, it that's not. Take it, that into it, account. it is adequate, and it's just, it's the limitation of, if you look at, you're looking at lifetime events, the, the impact of a bleed or a clot related to, to warfarin, and, and the frequency of those is so small in the, in, the, in the context of the rest of the individual's life that three days doesn't show up in the model. It's lost in all of the other noise. But we can't lose sight of the fact that three days for that individual is a huge impact. So economic models will help, but they don't answer all of the questions that we can, we can answer. So we have to understand the limitations of what modeling will tell us. And we have to understand that, wait a second, that's three days, and that's a huge input in that very short period of time for that individual, in that one week out of their 80 years of life. But you can't measure three days out of 80 years of life and expect that to show up in an economic model. Mark, what I heard you were saying is that economically it was a wash, that you, the cost, right? right? But when you take in patient preferences for having fewer, you know, to your point, Mary, yeah. that, that it intuitively, I don't think they, that you or Dave directly assess this through patient, you know, a questionnaire or anything like that. You ju it just made sense to say that patients may prefer yeah. to ha have fewer tests. Is that the point you were making? That's the point I was attempting to make, yes, yeah. But if you say the cost of those three days uh, is divided out amongst 80 years, if you also take the cost of the test and divide that out among 80 years of healthcare costs, then the cost of the test is insignificant also. So, That's correct. So yeah. then it seems like it would almost always be uh, either uh, a waste of time to do any economic analysis because it's never going to be significant on the total cost, or it's always going to be uh, you know, significant yeah. because well, it's, such is, a, it's such a small This is the cost. problem of presenting data like this at a very thing. Because the impact of having a death related to, you know, so the, the data that um, was presented about the, you know, having a mace uh, 
you know, that impact economically is enormous, and it, de and it detects the signal. The problem with, you know, the, 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 the warfarin is, is that the, at least based on the data at that time that we had available to us, um, we did not have much of a signal at, of some of those major bleeding or uh, clotting events that we could really, um, you know, that the, would show up well in the model, and that's why the economic modeling that was done around that time, because that study now is about eight years ago that we published that. So there were a number of economic models of warfarin that came out, and they were all over the map because the assumptions varied so widely in terms of, you know, one model showed it was highly cost effective um, because it prevented all events, which we know is just ridiculous. You can't prevent all the events. So does the sensitivity analysis on the cost of the actual cost of the genotyping come out to be significant or does it not really matter whether the cost is two hundred dollars or two thousand or it, 4, it, it does make a difference um, but it depends on the model that that you're using so for example in the um, HLA model um, the cost of the genotyping was a was um, uh, and we we show this in, in something called a tornado diagram where you show for all the different input variables, what is their impact from largest to smallest on the model? And cost of the genotyping testing in that one was a significant driver of cost effectiveness um, for, the, uh, for the model. Whereas for others, the cost of the test is much less sensitive. It's much more about the performance of the intervention. Okay, I think we need to, you can see that this group is highly engaged on the topic of cost effectiveness, which is great, but um, I think we need to move to our um, overall discussion. 